the lift in. Um, first of all, I want you to understand, I am exactly the same age as Amy was. So she would be, if she would be alive my age, she would be 60 years old. Um, I was born in Vienna, which is in Austria, which is um, south of Germany. And in 1938, that's now 50 years ago, Hitler came into Austria and occupied the country. And we Jews, because our family is Jewish, realized that um, it was going to be very difficult for us because we had knew from Germany what had happened to the Jewish people there. So my family decided to go to a safer country where Hitler wasn't um, occupying. But um, many people left already had left in Ger Germany, and many people again wanted to leave Austria. So it was not very difficult. It was very difficult to find a country who would take you in. America, for instance, only let in a very small amount of people. England too didn't let people in. Only. Um, if you were working as a housekeeper, a woman, if she was going to a family who worked as a housekeeper, was allowed to come in. But families were not let in, really. So my father, who had um, work in Holland, decided to go to Holland. But um, again, we were not allowed in, my mother, my brother, and me. And so we went illegally to Belgium. That means when we went in the train, but when we crossed the border, we lost our passport and we said we had no passport and they just let us go through. Um, Belgium is south of Holland, so it wasn't very far and my father visited us from time to time. Um, I, in Belgium you speak French and I had no idea of the language, but I was eight years old at the time and I was just put into a class and I had to understand or not understand. It was up to me, of course, I didn't understand. And I felt very, very bad for a long time. One day the teacher said we should um, have a dictation. And she dictated and she said, I have to join in. Of course, every word was wrong. And when we got it back, it was all marked with red. Each word was wrong. And I felt very, very bad and very ashamed. Nowadays, people do understand. There are lots of immigrants and um, you get um, lesson in English if you come to a country. But at that time, that wasn't done at all. After uh, um, several months, I started to pick up the language and I started to make friends. And it was my birthday, my ninth birthday. And I wanted to have a birthday party. And um, I asked my mother and the lady where we lived, we lived in a boarding house, if I could have a birthday party. And she said, yes, you can ask a few friends. Um, I'll just read you a little bit now what happened when I asked um, my friends at school. At the beginning of May, close to my ninth birthday, I longed to have a party and ask friends from school. Oh, please, Muti, that was my mom. I neck. I do so want a party and to blow out my candles on a cake. Well, all right, Eva, she said reluctantly, but we will have to ask Madame Leblanc first. To my delight, she agreed. Only a small party of six, mind, in my dining room, she said, but I will make a cake especially for you. I was so happy. I eagerly wrote the invitations to hand out to my three special friends in class. At break time, they asked me what presents I would like, and we excitedly decided together what games we would play. But the following morning, all three told me that the parents would not allow them to come. I could not believe it. Why? I was bewildered and very hurt. I think that it was then that I began to realize what it meant to be Jewish in that time. It hit me hard, and I felt like an outcast. This is the first time where I realized that I was not like the other children and I was um, having great difficulties to adjust. Um, a few months later, the war broke out between England, France against Germany, and my father decided it was unsafe to be in different countries because borders might be closed. And again, we went illegally to Holland to stay together as a family. The 
was in 1940. And um, <coughs> we, um, my father rented a flat on a uh, square called Merveda Plan, and that was the square where the Frank family lived as well. I don't know if you've seen photos, but I've got a photo of this square. This was the square. Um, yes, we lived on this side, and the Frank family lived on this side. On this square outside here, we always played in the evenings. Um, boys and girls, we played rounders, we played skipping, we hopscotch and all that. And um, that's where I met Anne. She was, as I said to you, exactly the same age as me. She was just a month um, younger, and she had a sister, Margot, who was three years older than Anne, and I had a brother who was three years older, so they were, became friends as well. So we had, um, um, the Germans invaded Holland as well in 1940, so it became again very difficult for us Jews, but at first we thought it might not be too bad, and um, so we carried on as good as we could, but slowly the, the measures the Germans took was very bad. We were not allowed to go out in the evening after 8 o'clock. We were not allowed to use trams. We were not allowed to ride bicycles, which was very important in Holland, because most people went everywhere by bicycle. We had to go to different schools, Jewish schools, which was just run by te Jewish teachers and Jewish pupils, but it all had to be set up because it didn't exist before. Um, we had to be allowed to go only to shops, certain shops. Anyway, we were not allowed to have radio. It became very, very difficult. And then we had to wear the yellow star, which um, um, identified as easily as being Jews. We just had to walk down the road, and anybody knew we were Jews, and we could have been arrested any time. If Germans walked in the street, German um, SS that was there, um, police force, they could, if they didn't like the face, they could just take you away and arrest you. Which did happen to a friend of my brother. It was a very hot day, and he had on his jacket, he had a star, but he took his jacket off, not thinking, and carried it on his arm. So he just walked in his shirt. And an SS man came, saw that um, he didn't wear his yellow star and saw that the star was on his jacket. He took him, took him to the police and the boy was never heard of. Um, in 1942, two years after that, um, the Germans sent out cards for young people between 15 and 21 that they had to report to, um, they called it the local theater, for uh, deportation to labor. My brother, who was 15 at the time, and Margot and his sister got this card and many, many other young people. Um, my family and the Frank family and many other families decided at that time that it was much too dangerous to send those cheap people to those labor camps and we decided to go into hiding. So this was the time that we all just disappeared. A lot of the other people hadn't taken measures to go into hiding because you had to arrange this, you had to have a contact, you had to have a place where you could go into hiding. Who didn't have that, sent their young children. And um, three, four weeks later, they got a car from the Germans that those children had died. Later it was known to her that they had just been murdered. So it was good that we disappeared. Like you all know, the Frank family went into the hiding place from the office of Otto, that was the father, who had um, in this building, um, it was a factory, but on top of this factory, there was this um, unused, um, um, unused room. Holland has got very narrow, um, Houses, and that is because on the canals, um, the ground is very expensive. So um, the houses are very narrow because if you have a bigger house, it is more expensive. So you have a very narrow house, but um, deep. 
um, far, deep, far away. And um, this is what um, what the, the Anne live in this. Um, um, So Anne lived um, in hiding in this place in um, the Prinzegracht. This is this place where Otto took his family. Um, it was a very, very small, small room where um, the whole family lived. Um, we went into hiding with a teacher, so we were not all together. My father and my brother stayed in a different place and we went to a teacher who took us in, and we stayed just upstairs, her room, in a little room. But it wasn't enough, like you remember perhaps that um, the Frank got betrayed. You, you had always to be very careful that, um, um, that you were not seen by people who, um, your neighbors or anybody like that. So um, um, we were not allowed to go we couldn't go to the toilet or use the kitchen while this teacher was um, was um, well not at home because we had to really be into hiding. Nobody was allowed to see or hear or notice that we lived there. And that is something you have to understand. To be for many, many months in a place, just in one room, and stay there. And um, especially if you're your age, you want to play with children, you want to have fresh air, which was impossible to do. Um, this was June 1942. We hoped the war would end Christmas time, perhaps. We thought it would only be a few months. But as you perhaps know, the war went on another three years after that. And three years is a very, very long time. Um, my mother, I was with my mother, and my mother got from this teacher books to teach me because I didn't want to miss my schoolwork, and I thought if I just miss a few months, I'll be able to catch on then when I can go back to school again. So I spent my time um, learning um, Dutch, a um, bit of French, a little bit of English, um, geography, history, and that kept me um, quite occupied. Um, but what I was telling you, the Germans had, um, um, they knew the Jews were being in, were hidden and they did searches. In the night, their vents went from street to street, they knocked on the doors and the people had to open the doors and they stormed in and they were searching the places if um, they could find Jews. So our underground contact group um, looked after us, who brought the special cars and um, um, provided us with um, this hiding place, said he was going to build a hiding place in the hiding place. And um, there was a little bathroom with a toilet in the end, and they decided they would make a false wall and tile it and make a trap door. So if the Germans would come and search, we would quickly go into this little toilet put this trap door in front and nobody would know that there was another little room behind. And the workmen, they came to do that and they worked very hard and in the evening by about 10 o'clock it was nearly finished but the trap door wasn't tiled yet. But they decided to finish it. And about midnight night they finished and they left. And we went to bed. And a few hours later we heard suddenly noise and a lot of noise in the street and there was knocks and um, we quickly went into this um, into this little hiding place and um, the Germans stormed up, looked everywhere, luckily they didn't find us and um, left again. But if those people hadn't worked the whole night, they wouldn't have been finished and they would have caught us. Later we heard that some people got caught because they Germans felt the beds and they were still warm. So they realized somebody was in the house and they searched and searched till they found the people. 
but it's this tan black in here that's still safe. And so we stayed in hiding another two years till we were betrayed, like the Frank family. We were betrayed in, 19, uh, in May 1944. The Franks were betrayed in, uh, in September, so a few months after us. Um, we were, um, we didn't know at the time that my father and brother who were in different places were as well caught. And when we were at the police station, we met them there. Um, we were interrogated by the Gestapo because they wanted to know who looked after us, who had helped us, but I didn't tell them anything. And a few days later, we were sent to the prison and to the local camp. And again, a few days later, they were already transported to Auschwitz, which is the biggest and main concentration camp. Um, you know, before you go on, you, you were taken on your birthday, weren't you? Yes, yes. Some of them, yeah. can you remember them? Yes, I sure can. It was my, um, was 44, it was my 15th birthday. And we were just sitting down at breakfast with the family. We had changed places at that time as well because the teacher who had hidden us got scared, you know, after so many years. And um, the danger became very great that we would be caught because um, neighbors started to be suspicious sometimes. You did hear a noise. And um, the teacher just was scared and said, you have to look for a different place, which um, we got again through the underground people who helped us. And this was a family who had a grown-up son, and we were just sitting at breakfast, and um, again we heard a big knock, and the gentleman went downstairs, opened the door, and at nine o'clock, there was usually no visitors, and um, we heard a big noise, and we noticed the Gestapo was the young son of the people who was um, at an age where um, the Germans always took those young people and um, he jumped over the um, over the table, jumped out of the window and over the roofs and disappeared. So when the Gestapo came, there was just the, the parents and us sitting there and they realized that we were the people they were looking because we were betrayed and the people said that it was a mother and a daughter. And so they took us away. They took us well the good people who hid us, but later through um, a deal my father and mother made with them, they gave the Germans all the jewelry which we had, and we let those people go free. Because usually the people who helped Jews got as well um, transported to the concentration camp, and very often they died as well. Um, Anyway, we got transported to Auschwitz only uh, a week after we were, had been still in hiding. Um, we had heard Auschwitz was a terrible camp because the uh, um, British BBC did send out messages on their illegal broadcasts. You know, you were not allowed to listen to English radio, only to German radio. But um, sometimes we did listen, and sometimes people did hear about it. And they had warned people about those terrible concentration camps, that people didn't just have to work, but that people were killed, guests. Um, can I tell this about that? Yes. Yeah. Um, this, the Germans are very, um, systematic, very uh, orderly people, and they had um, a whole system of how to destroy the Jews very systematically and orderly. They had those transport from all the European countries which they had um, occupied. France, Holland, Belgium, the Scandinavian countries, um, Italy, Hungary. They occupied nearly the whole of Europe at this time, Poland, and transport came from the whole of all everywhere to Poland, where those concentration camps were. And they built um, huge um, sheds, which um, looked like shower rooms. 
And so they're completely, there were no windows and just doors on one side when people came in. And um, little, these um, hidden windows where they could look what was happening inside. And there were pipes going on top like showers, but instead of water, there was gas coming out. So after the people who were um, meant for being gassed, we are locked up into those big rooms. The doors were locked, and instead of water, gas came. And the Germans could look through the little windows and see what had happened. And after a few seconds, those people started to become very faint and dizzy and felt peculiar, and they fell down and they dead. And this happened to thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, day in, day out. It's something one can't really understand, how people could do that. But it did happen. And I was in this camp where it happened. When we arrived there, um, we had heard about those stories, but it sounded so terrible that we said it can't be true. If we would have believed it, we would have given up hope. And if you give up hope, you give up life, because without hope you just can't live. So, so we knew what was happening, we still kept our hope up that somehow it couldn't be true, and that somehow we would come through. And this is one of the reasons why I'm still here. I wouldn't believe it, and I didn't give up hope. Um, when we got there, we got out of the train, which was um, not an ordinary train, but it was couple trucks. You know, big um, wagons with big sliding doors, which before cows or horses or pigs were transported. But now they put people in, and many more people than um, cows or horses went in hundreds and hundreds of people per wagon. And um, there was hardly any air, there was hardly any light, there were no facilities. We just had on each side of the um, train of the wagon, you had a bucket for toilet facilities, and the doors were closed. Once a day it was open, and you were given, uh, thrown in like um, animals in the zoo, you were thrown in a piece of bread. And the uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, bucket with drink. It was, of course, not enough, but um, it was only a few days, so most of us survived this transport. When we got to Auschwitz, we came out, and um, men and women had been separated right away then. The men went to one side, and the women to another side. Most people never saw their fathers or husbands or brothers anymore from that point on. I was again very, very lucky, and in the camp I did meet my father by great chance. This was again one instant which gave me hope to carry on, because I knew he was still alive, and I hoped we would be reunited later. Then we had to march in front of those SS who stood in front there, and the first selection, which meant people were um, sorted out between life and death. So um, we marched in front of those men who stood there with uh, guns and dogs. They used a lot of um, uh, Alsatian dogs who were trained to, on the order to attack people and tear them to pieces. If somebody would have run away, they would have let the dog loose and chased them after those people. So some children asked, why didn't you run away? Because you were many more than the Germans there, which was true. There were thousands of people, and the Germans were just a handful. But they had guns and they had the dogs. And then where would we have gone? You know, we were in a strange country. We had no idea where to go. We didn't know the language. Um, so we noticed then that young children and old people were sent to one side, and the younger people and um, 
groups of people around um, 20 and 40 were sent to the other side. I had worn a long coat and a hat because I thought what we were wearing we could keep those belongings. So that's again great luck for me because I was only 15. I got through this first selection because I looked a bit older. Um, so I entered the camp with my mother. So all the people who had got to the other side, we never saw them anymore. Then we entered the camp. We had to undress completely naked, had to leave all our clothes on a heap. We never saw our clothes or belongings anymore. And um, we stood for many hours and um, had to go then through people were sitting on tables like that and we had to pass in front. We got our numbers tattooed because from then on we were, had no name anymore, just a number. I've got this number. Mine is very pale because my mother said to the person, do it gently because she's only a child and she obliged. You can see it's a very pale number. Our transport had to be recalled later because they made a mistake with the number. Um, some people, the whole number was taken out and the new number was put on top. This means there was just one number wrong. But uh, Everybody had a number. Everybody had a number. A lot of people, as I said, had big numbers. Most people had actually big numbers like that. Um, I don't know if you can see, I have an A number here. Because by that time, they had started Again, people who were a bit longer before us have huge numbers with um, 100,658. But the numbers became so big that they started again and started with A and up again to high numbers. Um, Otto Frank, so he was, um, um, he came only in September, but he was in a different part of the camp. He had a very, very big number and a very, very high number. Um, Anne Frank, her sister and her mom came to the same camp in September. Uh, I never saw them there because there were tens and tens of thousands of people at this camp. Um, I'll just show you a picture if you can see. It's um, barrack after barrack after barrack, so far as you can see. Um, so, of course, that you would find anybody there would be very, very difficult. Um, the sleeping arrangement in those camps as well, very peculiar. In the very, very long barracks, which in the middle was kind of a chimney. It used to be... Um, um, barracks for horses. So on each side of this chimney, the, the horses used to stand and the middle chimney used to be heated in winter um, for the horses. But for it's just coming to the glass and Yes, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, the, for us, there was no heating used in winter at all. Um, those were kind of like cages. They were three high, and um, each of these compartments had to sleep ten people. Um, it was just planks and stones. Um, it was so narrow for ten people that there was no possibility to lie on your back or on your stomach. You had to lie on the side. And if one turned in the night, we all had to turn. Um, so we entered this camp. We got close, as I told you, all our belongings were taken away. And we had to have a shower then, which we were not sure it was a shower, but for us, luckily, it was an ordinary water shower. And then we got out on the other side, and um, we were given clothes. Anything. We got two garments, a panty, and a, anything else. 
could be a dress, it could be a blouse, anything. Didn't fit at all. And two shoes, it could be a size 10 and a size 5 and a size 3 and a size 8. And could be two left shoes, anything. So we, we tried to swap them and so that we could have at least, you know, the right kind of shoes to walk. Um, and then we were where we were taken to barracks like this. Um, the food in the camp was just enough to keep us alive. We got a small piece of bread in the morning and a little bit of um, tea or coffee. And um, this bread would last for the whole 24 hours until next day. Some people were so hungry that they ate it immediately and then they didn't have anything for the whole day or the evening. And of course they got very, very hungry in the evening. Some people kept it for the evening, but sometimes it got stolen, so that they didn't have it. Because people were really so hungry that people became very nasty and unpleasant. So they knew if they would steal somebody else's food, it could mean that those people would die. But because they were so hungry, they just very often took all the people's bread or um, whatever they could get hold of. And um, this um, picture of the glasses, that was, I was in a way lucky. I worked for um, a few weeks in a, um, in a part work group where we had to sort out the belongings of the people who had come to the camp. You might sound, sound silly to say lucky, but it was good work because um, we, could, we did find food there because um, all those belongings which I told you we had to leave when we entered the camp had to be sorted out because the Germans were using it again. And this, at that time, it was um, Germany had been to war already many years and they became very short of all kinds of supplies. So, for instance, all the glasses were sorted out and um, were sent back to Germany later on. So I worked <coughs> at this um, commando, which they called Kamada, because it was a symbol of the land of plenty. And I did find lots of food, so I could have a bit more food there. Of course, it was very sad work because I realized that the people who had left their belongings there were all guests or um, probably not alive anymore. And so we lived for nine months and then the Germans started to lose the war. We were in eastern um, Poland and we heard guns being shot and we realized that the Russians were approaching. And one day we woke up and the Germans had left. Because they realized um, it was um, um, too dangerous for them to stay. If the Russians were coming, they would all be killed. So they had just disappeared and left us behind. They had taken many, many people with them, but um, my mother and um, few hundred, because most there were not many people left at that time anymore, had stayed behind. We were for about, it was middle of winter, it was January, and it was very, very, very cold. And um, everything was covered in snow. And one day, a woman who, uh, we were 10 days on our own, no Germans, no Russians, and one day, and but it, we were walking around free, we had gone to the food supplies, we had taken all the food we could carry, all the food we could eat, plenty to eat. And um, we were just waiting what would happen. We hoped the Russians would come soon. And one day a woman started to cry, come, come, look, there's a bear at the gate. And um, we all came running and just took a huge creature, all in fur. And when we went near, it wasn't a bear, but it was our first Russian. But he looked like a bear because he was completely covered in fur. It was very, very cold. And they wore those um, lamb skins with um, 
all the fur and fur hats and all covered in snow and their eyebrows were all covered so you couldn't hardly see their faces. We had hardly, um, uh, we had taken clothes but we had not, uh, we were not protected because it's cold of course. And that's how we got liberated. Slowly the Russian organized us, they got gave lot of food and um, they put us in better um, accommodation. But the Germans and the Russians were still fighting there and um, they thought it was dangerous for us to stay there in case the Germans would conquer this camp again. So they took us east into Russia. And um, so we went again on those trains and um, we were for about four weeks, we were traveling with the Russian into, into deep into Russia. And um, one day they were standing in front of the trucks and I saw a familiar figure. And when I looked and went close, who did I recognize? Otto Frank and his father. And he had been, of course we didn't know that, you know, as I told you, they were betrayed in September and they, the family was sent to Auschwitz too. And Otto Frank survived as well there in the camp and he was with us on this transport and um, I introduced him to my mother. I knew the family, my mother knew Anna and Margaret, but she didn't knew the parents. And so we went to Odessa, which is on the Black Sea, which is quite far into Russia, and we waited there till the war would end, which was in May 1945. And then, um, a British troop transport ship came to fetch us back to whoever wanted to go to their own countries. There were French people, there were Italians, there were Belgium, there were Dutch people, and they took us back to France, and then we went back to Holland. Um, we went back to our own place, and one day Otto Frank appeared at our door and asked us if we had seen perhaps this um, children in Auschwitz. We hadn't seen Anna or Margot. But unfortunately, a few months later, the Red Cross, who had um, lists of all, you know, I told you we were registered with the number and the name, and um, it was um, registered that they had died, and as well my father and brother had died. And um, Otto Frank came to visit us a lot. And one day he came with Anna's diary to us. And he told us a story that me, the lady who had helped him survive in the hiding place because she brought the food to them, had found after they had been arrested, she went up to those rooms and there scattered on the floor was um, the papers that Anna had written because the Germans weren't interested in them and they had left that behind. And she collected all the papers, saw that it was a diary. She put it all neatly together and um, thought, I'll keep it till Anna comes back. Unfortunately, of course, Anna didn't come back. And um, when Otto came back, she gave it to him. And um, he knew she had kept the diary, but he didn't know what would have been in it. And very slowly, he started to read it. He was very, very moved by all this that she had written. He never knew that she had all those thoughts. So he knew her very well. He didn't think she would write all those details about all their life in the attic. And um, <coughs> he didn't want to have it published at all because he thought it was a very private book. But he did show it to um, several people and they all thought it was a very, very important document which people should read. And as well, Anne writes, she would like to carry on living after her death, and she would like to become a writer. So he thought, well, if he publishes the book and if people would read it, she would have become a writer and she would carry on living after her death. So he did publish it. He never realized how famous the book would have become, which it did. You, you know it has been translated in 60 languages and it's been read all over the world. And um, 
after eight years, my mother married Otto, and um, um, so he became my second father, really. So I know him very well. I think that is, um, I think that is um, what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> Okay, Chris, the orange button when you're ready. Is anybody? anybody I just wanted to, to tell you, I brought the book along, which I was it for the best. Um, That's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. It would actually, oh, I for the best work or whatever you want. Um, I bought a copy of, yes, of your book. Yes, but I want to uh, read some extras. To... That would be lovely. That would be lovely. So we'll, uh, actually, we've been writing a lot. Things that have come out of, uh, you, you know, you said, and wrote, I want to live on after my death, yes, and, and so. some of the parts of her diary we've looked closely at. There's an extract where she talks, um, I see how slowly, I see how the world is slowly becoming a desert, I hear more and more clearly the approaching thunder that will kill us. And we wrote one day about what, yes. you know, what yeah. we're frightened of and yes. thunder, and yeah. there's some very nice writing and poems yes. yeah. of different things like that. So, But it's always uh, quoted about Anne as well, that she says she still believes that people are good at heart, mm -hmm. which is a very famous quotation which mm -hmm. is used a lot. I always say, she wrote this before she was in the camp, yeah. so hopefully she would still have believed that till the end. Mm -hmm. Sorry, JJ, were you going to ask yeah. something? No. Um, do you have any memories of, of, of Anna before you went into hiding? I mean, you lived Oh, yes, yeah. I, I know very well how she looked, how she talked. Um, but of course, at that time, I didn't know how important she was going to be. So I didn't particularly um, take um, note of, you know, what she said or what she did. I only know that she was. Um, I was still very childish. I used to play with marbles and things like that. But she was already uh, very interested in boys, for instance. Um, she giggled about boys and, uh, you know, watched them in the past. And I wasn't interested at all yet. And then um, she collected film stars, which um, I wasn't particularly interested, which is like you do now, pop stars at that age, at that time. People collected film stars like um, Cary Grant and Jana Derby and Shirley Temple. Those are film stars which um, teenagers of this time saw as the most fantastic people. And in the hiding place, she pins them up as well. We've been doing some. You have, you have seen yeah, that. Yeah, we're making some little drawings to go on the scale model in the place. And that's right. Mm -hmm. And she had as well the um, um, our queen. Um, Queen Elizabeth at the time, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret. She was very impressed with those two little girls, which she saw this like Margaret and Anne, the sister. So those were two sisters as well. And there are pictures of those as well in the attic. Any questions, though? You know, like, um, when that boy jumped out of the window went over the roof, did you want to follow him? We, we were stunned. No, we, we wouldn't. We didn't. No. Yeah, it all happened too quickly. Yeah, it all happened too quickly. That's I think right. it was Eva's birthday as well. She was just sitting down to the birthday breakfast and then suddenly... Remember, do you remember I read that, that yeah. bit to you? Do you remember? Yeah. Um, you know when you stayed with the teacher and she became scared? Yes. Did, did she survive? Oh. Yes. Yes, she did. She did, and my mother is still friendly with her, so she must be now quite old. Yeah. How does it feel to, to be talking about it? Um, well, uh, for many, many years I couldn't have done it. I didn't eat. I've got three daughters, and I hardly ever spoke to them about anything that had happened. But um, I think it is very important that you should all know what happened. And that's why I overcame this reluctance to speak about it. And um, I got used to it now. But for instance, you know, my mother and Otto were married for um, nearly 30 years. And so they talked, of course, a lot about Anne and about hiding. And, 
They never exchanged about their experience in the camp. And now that Otto is dead, um, nine, nine years ago, um, when I wrote the book and I consulted with my mother, she very often said, I don't even know what Otto worked at, or I don't know what he did there. And they've never spoken about it. And this is lost forever now, you see. Yes. You know, when um, you went back to your house, what, did that bring back any memories? Yes, very much so, very much. And I found that, of course, very, very difficult. Yes, I wrote right about that, and um, I'll read this to you. Yes, when we came back, we couldn't go first to our house because other people lived there. It was late. But um, they were very nice people and they looked for some other accommodation and then they let us go back in this flat. So first we stayed at some friends which were called Rosenbaum. We remained with the Rosenbaums until early July before we could regain possession of our flat. It felt so eerie to walk up the stairs Inside, it was as if the intervening years had not taken place. It was three years that we hadn't been there. It was like stepping back in time. Everything looked exactly the same. I wandered in and out of the rooms. Our furniture was in the same place. The curtaining and paintwork was unchanged. And I went, when I looked for the spot on my bedroom wall where Puppy had marked my height, it was still there. I went to the window and looked down into the square. Some children were playing at one end of the tarmac. Later I heard the taxi door up in the street below and ran to open the door thinking, that's puppy coming home with Heinz. But it was only a neighbor from across the hall. Otto Frank visited us from time to time. Mutti was concerned about what to do with me. Should I go to school again or learn a profession? He advised her that strongly to send me back to finish my studies at school. The nightmare started at the end of July. I would wake up screaming. Once I woke up to see Mutti standing by my bed in her dressing gown, holding a glass of water for me. I can't sleep, Mutti, I said. I understand, she said, handing me the glass and sitting on my bed. When will Papi come home, I asked. Tomorrow maybe, she said, stroking my hair and kissing my forehead. Then she tucked me in under my precious quilt and waited on Heinz's bed until I fell asleep. I couldn't accept that my father and brother hadn't come back, you see. It took many, many, many years till I realized that they weren't going to come back. But we, um, you think they, uh, they, they didn't, they didn't remember that you would come back. They didn't think that you would have came back to the house. That's why they they stayed away. Did you think that? Um, I don't know that. Did you think? Did I think they couldn't come to the house? No. Did you think like right, that they forgot all about the house and they went and tried to start afresh in another country? No, I didn't think so. Because they would have, um, if they would be alive, they would certainly come to look for us and they would really have had another country to go. We, we did think, because you did hear after many years that some people got taken to Russia far, you know, into Siberia, and that it took them many, many years to come back. So that's why we hoped for a long time, perhaps it took them a long time to come back. But um, of course they didn't come back. Do you find I mean, you'll never forget it, but I mean, do you find that you um, can forgive what happened to you or, or not? I can't forgive those people who did it, the older Germans, the Nazis, you know, all those people who would be now my age or older, but the young German people, the children and grandchildren of those people, they are, of course, innocent had nothing to do with it. And they asked their parents and grandparents, what did you do in the war? Where were you? Where are you in those camps? Did you do anything? And they want to know. And um, they have a problem, because if you know that your 
father or your grandfather has been a murderer, it's a very difficult thing to live with. So I feel sorry for those Germans. So I don't hate those. How do you think you'd, uh, do you think you'd be able to forgive anybody who did that? Do you think? What do you think? For a long time you'll feel very bad, but you'll, you'll feel, um, when you go older, you'll feel if you have a hate in you. It's such a nasty feeling that you become unpleasant and bitter, and um, it doesn't help anybody. So you'll try to overcome this feeling, because hate and jealousy is a very, very nasty feeling, and it just makes you bad, and you don't want to be bad. So you always have to work on yourself to become a better person, not a worse person, otherwise you'll do the same mistake that the Germans have done. Another important thing I want to tell you, Hitler did um, how he educated his young people, you know, like we have here about Boy Scouts. He had a Hitler Youth, which was all young people had to join a group of young people <coughs> like Boy Scouts, and they were doing, first it sounded like nice things they were doing. So they were going camping, they were singing songs, they were marching. But slowly he started to do um, unpleasant things. He started to tell them only German people are good people. All the rest are bad people. And um, he started to educate them that any order you get, you have to do whatever it is. <coughs> and that's how he could get those people to join later in the SS. And those SS people were the real cruel, nasty people who did all this to us. But that was because slowly he educated them to become cruel, to obey orders, and to only consider his own group of Germans as good people, and all the rest not worth anything. Yes. Um, you know when you was in Haiti, do you reckon you had to be strong to survive it, um, to be in hiding? Like, yeah. Hiding wasn't that difficult. It was unpleasant, it was lonely, but, um, you know, nobody died from being in hiding. And, again, we always thought it might be a few weeks, a few months, and it won't be so long. But, of course, as time went on and on, you again said, well, now uh, six months have passed, now it will only be another few months. So, because it was a relatively short time, you thought it would be, you put up with it. If we would have known in 42 that it would take that long, we might have felt much worse. Yes. Did you, did you like get angry at times when you thought, oh, it was going to end and then it just kept carried on? Did you get angry? Oh, we did get angry and we did get depressed and we did get miserable. And we said, why don't those um, English land somewhere? Why don't they bomb more in Germany? Why don't they um, end the war quicker, you know? Of course, when America came into the war, we said, ah, oh, well, that's it, because um, we knew America was very strong. Now the war will end quickly. But again, it went on and on and on. And um, I don't know if you know, um, um, the Germans and the English fought in Africa, and Rommel, that was a very um, good German general. At first he conquered all this, but then he got defeated. And we thought, ah, well, now it will be the end. So we were always full of hope. We always thought, now the Germans will give up. Then they started to bomb German towns. We thought, well, that will end it. But it just didn't. It went on and on and on. A lot of uh, stones, I think they're called. That's <laughs> right. You know when you had your um, Jewish star on the Lord Star David, did you ever just want to pull it off and say, why do I have to wear this? Why can't a, a German wear um, something to show what they are? Um, in Holland, a lot of the non-Jews in the beginning did wear the star to confuse the Germans. 
But um, then um, they arrested those people and put them in prison, and then they stopped doing that. But um, the other day when I gave a talk, um, a boy asked me, why did you wear it? What if you wouldn't have worn it? You know, who would have known? But you must imagine Amsterdam, for instance, is not such a big town as London. And um, in our area where we lived, people knew we were Jews. And um, so the Dutch were, most of the Dutch were good people and sided with the Jews and were against the Germans. There were still people who were with the Germans. And like they betrayed us, they betrayed the Franks. And if we wouldn't have worn the yellow star, somebody could have betrayed us and um, um, we would have been killed quicker. Because we thought as long as we do what the Germans tell us, they won't kill us. But if we would have done something against the measures, then we knew we would be punished and that would have been, of course, much quicker death. You see, um, when you went in Hartford, did you have a diary or a, or a memo book? No, I didn't do that. Where did you um, get your Star of David from? You had to buy it. You had to pay for it. Um, we all bought about three, four, because we put it on different clothes, because you always had to show it. So if you wore a dress and a jacket, if you took the jacket off, it had to be on the dress. Did you think that you should have went to England instead of staying? Yes, exactly did. When the Germans came into Holland in 1940, when there was only a very, very short war, five days it lasted, because the German bombarded Rotterdam, which is one of the big towns. They flattened the whole town, and they said, if you don't um, capitulate now, we will flatten all your towns, and of course they capitulated. But in those five days, we went to the harbor in Amsterdam and we tried to get a boat to England. But um, there were not many boats going and those who went were already full. So we went back to our house and couldn't go. We thought Holland was safe because in the First World War it was safe. You know, Holland is very, very flat, completely flat, and they have a lot of water. And in the First World War, they opened the dikes and flooded the country, a lot of the country, and the Germans who stood at the borders couldn't enter. And they thought they were going to do that again. But of course, the warfare had changed dramatically. They had airplanes and parachutes, and they just landed behind the water lines, and like I said, they bombarded the town, and then Holland gave up. How long did you live in this country? Um, I came in 1951. Mm -hmm. I went um, after the war. I went to school to Holland in Holland first, but I never felt um, I never felt at home. I'd gone so, so so many things in those few years, and the other children hadn't. So I thought, didn't feel at home with them, and I went only for a year to England to. I thought I'll just get away and see how life is here. But I met my husband, I got married, and so I never went back. And um, like, now we've got like, um, you know we've got, what do you call it? You know the things that you can pull back in here, let out a stone or something. So. That's a book. Yeah. yeah. Did you have anything like that in um, your, when you were in Holland, and like you thought if the Germans would come on shoot you at him, or anything like that? Like the um, kids, kids would. You mean? To, to try and resist the Germans in any yeah. way they could. Yeah, like when like little children like I on telly when you see them get out their little catapult and start like shooting at their police and then they run off. Uh, well yes, I'm sure some some people try to go to other other places. That's true. That's true. I think it's the Germans were so powerful. You know, but when the Germans came with their army, they were so powerful that I think, you know, if, if tanks suddenly appeared on the street, on Beechwood Road or Forest Road or Holly Street, and soldiers with guns and, you know, in battle dress, 
really. I mean, maybe out of out of anger or desperation, you might throw stones, but it, it would be pretty get you anywhere. Thing. Yeah. But it did happen. You know, it did happen that people spat in a German's face, for instance. You know, but they were right away arrested and um, sometimes shot on the spot. Sometimes sent to a concentration camp. Mm. Um, people did try to escape, you know, from all over. Um, when the Germans uh, occupied Holland, people tried to go to Switzerland, um, tried to cross borders. So there were few people who did escape, must admit that. But compared to the Southland Southland who didn't, it was only a very, very small proportion. And then, unfortunately, again, even Switzerland, when people came illegally across the border, very often they were sent back. Mm. Terrible things. Could you get any weapons? Not really. The underground movement did have weapons, but, um, you know, not many. Oh, and they did, um, <coughs> um, um, later on, when they got more organized, they did blow up bridges and, you know, like you've seen in resistance films, it did do a little harm, of course, but um, compared with the big power of the Germans, it was really very little. They printed illegal papers, told people what was happening, you know, and gave hope to people. Um, of course, at first, very little, but slowly they organized themselves, and uh, it became more and more. Because I thought, like, cause there's more <coughs> Jews, there was more Jews than there was um, Germans or Nazis, or you could overpower them if you had some weapons and stuff. No, but Only not, in the camps, no. Jane. Only in the camps. I mean, Jewish people were a minority in the countries they lived in. So, you know, there was a small number of Jewish people compared to the number of Germans living in Germany. And there was a small number of Jews, you know, living in Holland. And uh, here too, I mean, I don't know how many Jews in, in the UK, about half a million? Yes, but um, I mean, if Ger the Germans would occupy, let's say, England, they couldn't s send that many, you see. But they have the weapons, and they have the they have the power. Mm. And um, like in the camp, again, you know, we were hundred thousand people in the camp, and the Germans were thousands of people compared nothing. But um, where could you have escaped to? You know, you were shaved, you had, you had no clothes, would, everybody would recognize you right away if you would have escaped. And the thing, you had no weapons, you, you, where could you have gone? Some people did escape, very few did, were hidden then by a farmer, but mostly they were caught by the dogs or by um, the Germans, or they were betrayed even by the people. So. Um, and don't forget, through the little food we had, um, we were stunned all the time. We were weak. Um, things were so um, we were so overpowered mentally that we, you know, we we had given up struggle. We didn't really know what to do or how to do it. You might have heard about the Warsaw ghetto where people did um, resist, but the end was that they were all killed. Finally, one, you know, I was asking you how long you've been in this country. Have you ever met any anti-Jewish feeling in this country? I mean, do, you, do you come across people, anybody discriminating against you here? Um, personally, I haven't. Mm -hmm. But um, you do hear, of course, of um, people who have noticed it. And um, it does exist. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think anything like ha it happened in Germany, I don't think it could happen here, not on this scale. You know when you're speaking about like the trains and stuff, mm -hmm. and then they, they, the people were in darkness, but when you were speaking about that, I, I had some thoughts about like, there might be, like at the top of the door there might be a place that you can like, um, hide up, up there, like you can stand there, and when the Germans come, you be jumping them. And that's what I kept on thinking when he was talking about uh, being in the train. Well, it was closed, you know. It was like a like a prison wagon. There was only a tiny little 
barred window on the top where you couldn't get out. And um, when they opened the doors to bring the food, there were Germans there with their guns. So if you would have jumped out, they would have shot you right away. I, I think I think the questions you're asking, Jay, are the questions actually that we're all asking. How how could it you know, how could it happen? It's absolutely it's it's almost impossible to understand what experiences Eva and millions like her went through. And it's I mean I I first learnt about what happened when I was about seven or eight years old and since then, I've been trying to understand it, and it's still impossible for me to understand. I think that's what your questions are about, really. How how could it be that you you know you couldn't get a, a, a way that you, you know you couldn't escape, and how could it be that so many people were were victimised like this? And I think it's 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 impossible to understand, really. It is impossible to understand. So don't worry if you if you don't understand it because it's no, it is something we, we, we can't understand. But what is even worse what we can't understand, how German people could do things like that to other people. I mean you've heard that they take taken babies and just thrown them against the wall and killed them or it's something impossible to understand. When the Russians came into Germany you hear very often, oh, the Russians are cruel, the Russians did terrible things. But um, Russia has been occupied by the Germans as well. The Germans advanced into Russia and they did those things to the Russian towns and villages. They lined up all the inhabitants and just gunned them down. And um, sometimes um, few people did escape from those villages, Russian youngsters and they stayed with the Russian army. And those came back then into Germany, and of course they had terrific hate, and they went into Germany really with hate and feelings they were going to get the Germans, which they did. So that's what you hear when the Russian entered Germany. They did a lot of um, killing and harm there, but that is understandable. Well, if I was you, I don't think I would I would like, I would still hate the Jews right now. I think I... The Jews? I the mean, Germans, the Germans. Come in. Even though I know, like, people say time, time heals everything, I don't think I would have got over it. I know that um, a lot of people feel like that, but you must not forget that those Germans you speak about now are young people like you who didn't even, were not even alive when that happened. So you must not generalize, you must not say that. You must not say, because their grandparents did bad things, I hate you. But then we do the same things as the German did. And you see, that's perhaps a bit difficult for you to understand. After the First World War, um, the French and the English made uh, Germany a very bad peace contract. And Germany had it very, very bad after the First World War. And that's why it was difficult in Germany. That's why Hitler had a chance to become to power, because it was very difficult in Germany. There were no jobs, there was terrible inflation. People had it very, very bad. So Hitler came and said, um, I'll help you, I'll help you get jobs, I'll make it good for you again. And of course, people went along with it. So if we have this attitude again, we'll outlaw the Germans, we won't give them anything then have it bad, then we'll have a chance that this will happen again and again. So you, we have to be very careful. Because they were saying, like, I think Hitler was saying that um, the Jews have got all the shops and they're making us unemployed, so um, I saw I reckon the, the, the Jews, like, the Germans like killed the Jews because they had all the shops and they weren't getting jobs. But that wasn't true, that was just the propaganda, that was just what Hitler told them, that was just um, what he tried to to yeah. tell them, but it wasn't true, it wasn't true. Okay, before we stop, did anybody else have a question? <coughs> no? No? Mm -hmm. Pete? No? Okay, yeah, thank you very much.